morning, please take your Bible and open to the Gospel of John. We are back in the Gospel of John. We have been for several weeks, and today we are going to finish chapter 16. So we'll begin in uh, verse 16, and we'll go through the end of the chapter. Larger portion of Scripture, I know, but kind of one of the tricks of going through narrative is finding the themes and how the themes fit together. So this is, um, this all fits together. I wonder if you've been stressed this week or distressed or sorrowful or lonely. This is a great passage uh, for you this morning. What I'm about to read to you takes place on the verge of the worst evening and three-day period that Jesus' disciples would ever encounter in their life. And only a matter of possibly even of minutes now or hours, uh, Jesus is going to be arrested and they're going to abandon him and he's going to be crucified. He's going to die and he's going to be gone. And this is going to be the worst period of their life. And so what's really amazing about this is we get to see what Jesus says as, a, as he wants to pastor to, to his disciples. He wants to help them in one of their greatest times of trouble. So if you're troubled and you're stressed... This is an amazing passage. So I'd ask you to stand now as I read this section of John, John chapter 16, beginning of verse 16 through the end of the chapter. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, in a little while, and you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father... So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. And Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. And that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. And that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figures of speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered answered them, "Do Do you really believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Recently, I watched this documentary called Going Clear. Have you heard of this documentary called Going Clear? Going Clear is a documentary about Scientology. Scientology, um, which is kind of like this cult religion, which was founded by L. Ron Hubbard. It's kind of a new age uh, religion. You may have heard of Scientology through a celebrity. That's kind of what they're known for, right? They have a big headquarters there in L.A., It's a really strange-looking building. If you ever go there, you can drive by it. Um, Tom Cruise, maybe. Maybe you've heard of Scientology through Tom Cruise, right? He's like the ambassador to the world of Scientology. That's really how they view him. Um, But John Travolta, you know John Travolta? You know him? 
Yeah, you guys know him, right? Yeah. Um, Saturday Night Fever, Grease, you know the Grease guy, and Pulp Fiction, several others, and, you know, the, uh, the all-time famous face-off. You remember that crazy movie? John Travolta, in this documentary, they're talking to him. He says this, The goals of Scientology are the end of all wars, the end of all criminality, the end of all mental illness. Name me one other religion that has these goals. He says the main goal, the center of it, the center component is joy. And he says, name me one other religion that center aim is joy. There's not any, he says. They've, they've never heard of one. And I thought to myself, my goodness, John Travolta has never spent five minutes with an actual Christian. He never has. There's no way he could have. Or he couldn't possibly believe those things. Because Christianity is all about a God who's moving history to a goal where there's the end of all wars, there's the end of all criminality and mental illness, and we would add to that sickness, disease, and even the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And we would say, rightly, as the Bible says, that all of these happen because of the work of Christ, who is infinite joy. So there's no way, and I'm thinking to myself, just give me, give me 30 seconds. If, if you know John Travolta, tag him. Tag him in the sermon. Because this is all about joy. And what's interesting about this text is this comes on the verge of the worst time, I think, in the disciples' entire lives. I think it's right to understand that as the greatest stress, the greatest turmoil that they'll ever face in their life. Yes, there's going to be all of that come later, but this is pre-resurrection. And we see Jesus as a great pastor. And he's ministering to these men who are about to encounter this. And we've been in this, this is called the farewell discourse. Remember this? It, it, it comes start in, in chapter 13. Well, now it's, it's, it's ending. Where we go next is Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. And then after that, he's betrayed and arrested and crucified. And this is the end of his private ministry, the end of chapter 16. It's the last words he gets to say to them. And several themes come up, which we've already encountered in this farewell discourse. But this is it. This is his last opportunity to prepare them and to minister to them. Profound truth is found here. And it's not just for these disciples, because this is timeless. There are timeless truths here. And we live in a world that is filled with stress and trouble and pain. And that's what is one of the beauties of Christianity. Christianity never hides this reality. Not real Christianity. The world is filled with pain and sorrow. And there's no escapism. But what we find is that within this, things are transformed. So you'll see these kind of theme of sorrow turning to joy. And then later you'll see tribulation turning to peace. And that's what we see in this passage. This passage is all about joy. And so what we want to look at to help frame our understanding in this narrative, there's themes that hold it together, the theme of joy. It all focuses on Christ. Three ways Jesus gives his people joy in a troubled world. I think we see clearly three ways Jesus gives his people joy in a hostile and troubled world. And that's what we'll see today. And we observe Jesus with his disciples, as, as we said. This world that they are living in and what they're about to go into, they have trouble now, but it doesn't mean it just ends after Jesus rises from the dead He's going to commission them out into a world, and these type of trouble and sorrow and stress, it, it continues. So Jesus' people throughout all time, we're never exempt from what goes on in the world, are we? I mean, we feel it now. I mean, the effects of the fall, they're all, all around us. I mean, I think you would probably be lying if you said in the last month you haven't had periods of intense stress and pressure, uh, Right? And this is the, the, the country that we're in right now. It's living in absolute turmoil. And it's all around us. And so I think the text is absolutely relevant today. Super relevant. Hyper relevant. Uh, well, who can organize this but God's providence? Again, here we are. We find ourselves with all of this going on in the world, and we have the perfect text again for us. And so this text has the ability to really minister to you if you'll listen to what God has said to his people. So that's my goal. Is my hope is that you would listen See how Jesus ministers to his disciples, but it's not just for his disciples, it's for us as well. And Jesus is a realist. He's as real as it gets. Um, he doesn't say, follow me and all your troubles go away. Right? 
you're going to have to take up your cross daily and die to follow me. Things are going to get bad. If you decide to follow me, you know, there's no guarantee. And what the world knows is happiness, there's no, no guarantee that's what you have. But he does guarantee, as we'll see, joy and peace. Incredible passage. So let's jump into this passage. And let's see three ways Jesus gives his people joy in a hostile world. First, number one, Jesus gives an unstealable source of joy. Now, this is really amazing, and you'll see it as it unfolds. Verses 16 through 22, they kind of contain one idea. It's all about sorrow. It's all about sorrow turning into joy. How the disciples' deep grief and sorrow are going to turn into something that can really only be described as mega joy. I try to think of another word, but I don't, there's not another word. So let's make one up. Mega joy. Sorrow into mega joy. <laughs> so Jesus begins, and it, they're perplexed. You see it, right? It takes up a big portion of Scripture. And so you just want to see what's going on. And he's like, in a little while, um, you're not going to see me anymore. And then in a little while, you're going to see me again. And they're like, what, what is he talking about? What do you mean? He say, a little while, I'm not going to see you. And they, you know, they're try, probably going back and forth with each other. And Jesus is watching, and you see, he says, he knows what they're, what they're doing. They're debating, what is he talking about? He, Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves? What do I mean in a little while? You're not going to see me. And then in a little while, you're going to see me. And then in a little while, you'll see me again, and your sorrow is going to tor- turn into joy. They're confused, and to be honest with you, I think a lot of theologians are confused. I was laughing with George about this. Like, sometimes I think you can become so educated, you just can't see what's in front of you. So people write all kinds of things. Is Jesus talking about the time period between his first coming and his second coming? What do you guys think? Let's see how good of interpreters you are. What is the most plain meaning? In a little while, they're going to take me away. That's what he's telling them. In a little while, they're going to take me away. They're going to take me from you. And you're going to see it. I'm going to be arrested. They're going to take me. They're going to beat me, torture me, crucify me. And they're going to see him. He's going to be dead. They're going to say, the person we thought was the savior of the world is now dead. They're going to take him and put him in a tomb. And they won't see him anymore. And the disciples, they, they're, this is going to mess their whole world up. And he's saying the words Jesus uses, you're going to lament. It's like the Old Testament picture where they tear their clothes and throw ash, you know, there. He's like, you're going to lament. Your sorrow is going to be deep. And you can imagine what it would be like, can you not? All of your hopes and your dreams rest here, and they're on Jesus. And he says, you're, in a little while, you're not going to see me anymore. That's it. And you're going to have deep sorrow and grief and pain. But in a little while... You're going to see me again, and your sorrow is going to turn into joy. (laughs) Obviously, can you not imagine? Can you imagine what that'd be like? Uh, Who sees someone come back from the dead? I mean, Jesus is predicting his resurrection, that he's going to conquer death. The disciples are afraid. Who wouldn't be afraid? The Roman Empire, the power of the Jewish leaders, and as we'll see, they scatter too, but they take Jesus' life. They have that power to kill. And now they're going to see, oh, Jesus is back. Can you just imagine what that would be like? We just read it over, we talk about it all the time. But just imagine seeing that someone is dead, that Jesus, your hero, is dead. And you think, all of the Bible is wrong. Is all the Bible wrong? Is God a liar? Because you, you, they're not grasping it all yet. They don't have all the pieces. And then you see him, he's alive. Imagine Again, the only word is mega joy. The mega joy from sorrow. Now what's amazing is Jesus uses a little illustration. A figure of speech. That's what he calls it. Here's a little figure of speech for you. It's like a woman that's in labor. That's what he tells the disciples you're about to go through. You're about to go through such pain and sorrow. I'll give you the best worldly illustration. It's of a woman in labor. And when a woman is in labor, her whole world, her whole existence is encapsulated in pain. Right? That's her whole reality. It's just pain. It's her very existence. And then the baby is born, right? And something different happens. And labor does strange things to, uh, to people when you're in, all, in this all-encompassing pain. I remember when Angie was in labor with Drake. It was a very long. It was like over 24 hours long. 
Much harder for her, I'll confess to you, because uh, the Yankees were playing the Red Sox. And my job was to hold her hand and watch this baseball game. And uh, that's the Kurt Schilling Bloody Sock. That's a legendary game, by the way. You guys know this? You can look it up later. Um, but there come a point where the labor is so intense, right? And we're like, okay, things are moving along. And, and so it's all, uh, she's engulfed in pain, right? The pain is her existence. And she tells me, she says, she, says, she looks over, she's like, pull my hair. And I'm, and I'm like, what? And then it's like I didn't hear it right, so she went exorcist on me. She's like, pull my hair! Pull it! And I'm like, all right. Grab a handful of that hair, and I, and I give it a pull, and I'm pulling the hair. And, uh, and it was weird. It was weird for me. But that's all she could think of was the pain. And just, there's got to be some relief of this pain. But then later, the baby comes. It's like, a, did this even happen? Did I just pull your hair? Like, like try to pull your hair out of your head where you just being weird on me. It's like it never happened. It's just smiles. And immediate. It's like that. Bam. Did you forget what just happened? Because I didn't forget. I'm not going to forget it ever. Right? And, and you're happy and you're smiling. And, and, and it's a perfect illustration. Like the disciples, that's all they, they can fathom. This, my world is turned upside down. And Jesus says in a little while, it's going to be like that. Boom. And it's just going to be joy pure joy that you they can't even fathom the level of joy they're about to experience and the next statement i think is incredible and no one will take your joy from you and so you say how is that possible well here's the only explanation the only explanation is that jesus has become the unstealable source of joy and this gets down to a Christian distinction that's particular to our faith. The difference between joy and happiness. Happiness, I've heard it said, depends on what happens to you. And I think that's right. And people run through this world chasing happiness. And so, you know, your happiness level will go up and down depending on where you're at and whatever you're chasing after, right? And everybody's got a different thing for them, you know, something that scratches that itch, and you'll pursue it, and you'll get it, and you'll be happy for a while. But what happens? It always wears off, right? It always wears off. Uh, I, I think, was it Nick Saban? He has this little thing. I can't remember the whole thing, but he's like, you know, if you want to be happy for a day, uh, eat a cheesecake or whatever. You want to be happy for a month, buy a car. And he goes through all these things. And, of course, it makes total sense. You're like, yeah, I get that. Yeah, yeah. Because I bought a car, and it made me happy. And then, you know, after a while, I don't even wash it anymore. And maybe I'm sorry I even bought it. And that's the way of the world. Everybody's chasing happiness. And, and in reality, the Christian life is not about the continual pursuit of happiness. We may go through periods where we're not happy at all. Um, because of the pressures of the world, the things of this world, depression, whatever it is. And Jesus never promises you to be happy. I, I try to find it. I, 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 there is a clear distinction. But joy is different. Not to say that joy isn't an emotion, but this type of joy, which is emotional, can't be taken away by circumstances. It can't be robbed. Any other happiness can be robbed. If your happiness is in a person and they die, there goes your happiness. It's gone. Maybe forever. Forever, right? But this is why the joy is unstealable. Because the Christian joy is in a person and a person that's now defeated death. And that lives forever. And he says to them, you're going to experience this joy and no one can ever take it from you. Why? Because he's untouchable. What? It, what do you do with a, with a person that raises from the dead? Right? The gov world governments, they're going to be in a scramble. Find me a body. Right? They're freaked out. Um, it could cause a worldwide revolution, a man who beat death. And 500 people have seen him alive? That's what you're telling me? So no matter whatever is going on in the disciples' life, from here to their death, right? there's something different. And the difference is um, they've got this joy. So that they're in a jail cell, right? They're in a jail cell. And they start to sing. Who sings in a jail cell? Well, Christians, that's who. 
Christians sing in jail. This is the story of Christians throughout all times, that they have this joy. So you could be at your darkest moment of despair, death of a child. And then out of nowhere, the ministry, the direct ministry of God through the Spirit, there's joy. It's it's inexplainable to the world. But this is what Jesus gives us. He gives us an unstealable source of joy. Because he is the source of joy. So the first way Jesus gives his people joy in a hostile world is that he is their unstealable source of joy. Second, Jesus provides a new way of praying. And you know, that's kind of a plain heading. Well, that's because we don't get the dynamic of Christian prayer and how amazing it really is. Everyone prays, everybody. I'm convinced of it. You'll never convince me otherwise. Everybody prays eventually. People go through their entire lives in rebellion against God, saying they're atheist, agnostic, whatever you name it. But if the right set of circumstances happen, they'll pray. They pray. Usually it takes some catastrophic event. It could be a prayer of God help me, or it could be a prayer of God I hate you. But everybody prays. Even non-religious people pray. They may say, you know, I'm not an atheist, but I'm, you know, I'm just kind of not religious. And it's always like, oh, God, I need help. They can't help it. It just comes out like, oh, God, I need help with this. What am I going to do? Like, what did you say? I thought you weren't religious. Right? You can't help it. It's just a reflex. We're wired. We're wired to have communication with God. The religiously devout, they pray. Um, uh, Muslims pray. They pray a lot. Jews pray a lot. Right? Dedicated times even for these religions. Theists pray. But not all prayers are equal. Not even close. No one on earth prays like a Christian prays. And this reality of Christian prayer is all tied up in Jesus and His work. Verse 23 says, in that day, if you look back at your text, you'll see in that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask in the, my, the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And that day points us to this um, same era, the same reality, right? The new coming, the new covenant era that Jesus talked about previously, which we dealt with last week, where Jesus would say, I have many more things to say to you now, but you can't bear them. But when the Holy Spirit comes... He'll guide you into all the truth. And so that what, is, what did we learn? We learned, well, Jesus will continue to teach them. He'll continue to speak to them. And the Spirit will make it plain and make it known. And so when he says, in that day, that points forward again to that era. Christ ascends. He sends the Spirit. And this new time, the new covenant, is a new era of communication between God and His people. Never before do we have this revelation like is going to happen with the disciples, and never before do we have like illumination like this. It's, it's a new era based in Christ, but communication is a two-way street. And so the new part of the new covenant is we get a new way to pray that no one's ever prayed like before, including the disciples. He says, until now you have asked nothing in my name. But there's coming a time where you will, and that's what he's pointing to. In that day... Jesus teaches this new reality. We'll pray directly to the Father in Jesus' name, and God will hear us. And and we all go, oh, we grew up with that. Wow, gone. Eh. We've heard that a million times, right? (laughs) But you don't understand what's really happening. If if you can can yawn at it, right, you don't really get it. Because nobody in history prays like that. There's a temple prior to this. Most people would go to that temple to pray. And if you couldn't go there, well, you need to lay down somewhere and face that way. Position your body in the direction of the temple. Because there in the temple, inside the Holy of Holies, that's where God is. And, and you can't get there, but you know, perhaps if you turn toward that direction, 
But this is a whole new reality. This is a whole new reality. No one's ever prayed like this. It's a new privileged way of praying that only Jesus' disciples get. You're going to ask the Father. In my name. Look at verse 25. It may seem a little strange, but I think keep it in context. It'll help us to kind of get what's going on. This new era would provide this new key of communication that they had not, it hadn't arrived yet. So Jesus tells them, in that time, right, I'm not going to speak to you in figures of speech anymore. Um, see, he has been using figures of speech, right, to help them understand uh, the woman in labor and these things. But in the new era, marked by this new understanding of the work of God, he'll be able to speak through the Spirit to them directly and clearly. And this new communication that is brought about, and the disciples will pray. Notice this too. The disciples pray to a father. Well, Old Testament saints, they don't, they don't refer to God like that. A father? Jesus says, you will ask the father yourself. I'm not telling you that, you know, you're going to ask me, and then I'll ask the father for you. I'm telling you, you're going to ask the father because the father loves you. That's a new reality that no one on earth has. Nobody had. Nobody had that reality. That you, now, us, just mere mortals, can go before God, the creator of the universe, the Father, and He loves us, and so He lets us approach Him. Like we're, this is the same God that was so holy. You know, you touch the Ark of the Covenant, you fall over dead. And now Jesus is saying, hey, you're going to go into the presence of this Father, this holy God. I'm not going to I'm not going to have to like relay it for you. I'm telling you this is how privileged you are that you get to go because he loves you. And you're going to ask in my name. And this is important too because we can think oh this is just like a Christian phrase. We just tack it on. We've talked about this before several months ago in John 14 uh, and 15. It's like these things keep coming up, right? It's not just a phrase we tack on at the end. I, in Jesus' name, amen. In Christ's name, amen. A helpful illustration, maybe. Okay, picture yourself. you got to put yourself back in the Roman period, the great emperor of the vast domain. Like, people just can't go visit the emperor, right? You've got a request from your village, and you're like, you know what, I think I'm going to go ask the emperor. Well, that doesn't happen. And now times that by infinity with God. Who are you to go talk to God? You're nobody. But something happens, Right? Something special happens. If Jesus tells us to go in his name, that makes all the difference, right? The relationship changes because of the work of Christ. So it's like, okay, same time period, emperor. I'm just a soldier, a common peasant in the Roman army. And what if my general says, hey, go to the emperor because I need, I need resources. So you make your way to Rome and he's like, who are you? Who are, who are you, peasant Jay? Who are you? Why'd you come in here? You say, well, yes, I'm, you know, Peasant Jay, but I came to you in the name of, you know, General Maximus, the commander of the north. And he's like, oh, you're here in his name? Well, what, what does he want? <laughs> right? And so you're asking now in this person's name, according to their will, according to their wishes. And this is what happens when, when we come as Christians. But it's even better than that, because it's not just, hey, peasant. It's like, a new reality has changed. And it's like, hey, son, what do you, what do you need? And he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm privileged to be here, but I'm not even really coming in my own name. I'm coming in Jesus' name. And I'm asking according to his will and his wishes and his desires. And you'll notice again what happens. He... <laughs> He says, you're going you're gonna to pray like this, and your joy will be full. But we think prayer is just something, right? We think it's just something. <laughs> but it's a gateway into joy. That's what it is. You, you have access to a Father who loves you. And no matter what's going on in the circumstances of life, Jesus has promised you have this access. No one else has this. Nobody else can do this. No other religions 
They can do whatever they're going to do. You know, they pray and it earns God's merit. This isn't merit-based. None of that. God initiated this by the sending of His Son because He loved us. And then we then love the Son. And then the, the Father's like, oh, you know what? New sons and new daughters, come in, come in here and talk to me. And that is a gateway to joy. Do you see how it's working together in this passage? And I love the little micro gospel. That's, that's what you see in verse 28. That's the key to this reality. Verse 28 is the key to this new reality of prayer. It's a little micro gospel. I came from the Father, and I have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world, and I am going to the Father. Without that, you have no access to pray to God. You have no direct access to the Father. But because of that, because of verse 28, because Christ was sent here. This is initiated by the Father in His love for His people. And He sends Christ everything that they would ever need. He would obey God's law perfectly. He would die for His people's sins. He would be crucified, buried, and raised on the third day. And He would return victorious to the Father. And it opens a new reality. Just think, this is like a time-space continuum splits open. And you get to be with God. No matter where you are. There are Christians all over this country right now. There are some, as we talked about in the members meeting, they're in jail. They're, they're, there's a street in Belarus where you, Christian, could go walk over the street and there'd be Christians in jail beneath you. And even if that were the place where you would be, this reality is still true. They have access. They have access to infinite joy. Read any Christian history, and you'll find it to be true. Those that are greatly persecuted, even to the point of death, they know this joy. It's very real, and it is regardless of all circumstances. And so let's, let's think about that. The reality of prayer that you probably neglect, because Christians, we all, if you take a survey, what do you wish you did more? Uh, I, don't, I don't ever pray enough. So all Christians always say that. I wish I prayed more. Well, just pray more. You're so privileged to do it. No one can do this. No one gets to pray like this but us. So this is the second way Jesus gives peace uh, to his peace and joy to his people. He gives joy to his people in a troubled world by, number one, giving them an unstealable source of joy. That's himself. And second, the second way he gives joy to his people in a hostile world is he secures for us a new way of praying. And lastly, Jesus secures peace and tribulation through his victory. Look back at your passage, you'll see this. Jesus secures peace and tribulation through victory. Verse 33 is the key to understanding this. But before we get to verse 33, we go through some other verses. So verse 29 is kind of based off of what Jesus said in 28, because that's kind of clear, right? I came from the Father, I'm going back to the Father. And they're like, oh, you're speaking plainly now. You're speaking plainly. And now we believe, now we believe that you came from God and no one to ask you any questions. Now we really believe. Now, here's a, this is interesting, right? What does Jesus say? We, don't, we can't hear what he sounded like. But, right, I think it's sarcastic. Now, we think of sarcasm as associated with sin. This would be sinless sarcasm. Sinless sarcasm, right? Hmm. Do you, do you really believe? Uh, let me tell you what's about to happen. <laughs> right? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will all be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Right? You get it? Can you pick up on the sarcasm? You really believe now? Well, uh, you're all about to abandon me. How's that, how's that for belief? Right? Uh, I think the verse clearly shows that the disciples often said correct, uh, correct theological things. Like they say, they have correct theology. You know, they don't have all the pieces, but occasionally they'll say right things. And, um, but they don't, they're not there yet, right? And that can be the same for, for all of us. 
It also shows us how easily someone who can profess belief um, doesn't really believe, <laughs> right? Um, that, and that's, that's us. That's the story of, I think, where we are. Where every, Everyone's a Christian down here. Everybody, you know? Everyone's a Christian in southwest Oklahoma. And they all, many people have the right doctrine. They can say the right doctrine a lot. And they might even profess. But the reality is, you can make a profession. Uh, but there's no inward reality. And eventually it shows in your outward life. And that's exactly what happens with the disciples. They come to get Jesus and they abandon him. They drop him like that. Because they value their life more than anything else, right? They're terrified. They're going to kill Jesus. Well, that means they're going to kill us too. And they just leave him. They just abandon him. And so Jesus says, you're coming. there's coming a time where you're just going to all abandon me and leave me alone. Now think about this side note too. <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus knows what it's like to be alone. I wonder if you're alone. Are you alone? Have you ever been lonely? Jesus knows what it's like to be alone. Maybe more alone than anyone. I've never had all of my friends abandon me when I needed them most. And they all leave him. He has no one. He's literally, Jesus is the man of sorrows, the man well acquainted with grief. That's who he is. He is perhaps the most real human that's ever lived. He's a realist. He's not like these other gurus, these other false prophets. Jesus knows loneliness and pain and grief, turmoil. He, know, he knows all of these things intimately. What a great comfort that is. That's a great comfort for me. It should be for you. You can never say, God, you don't know what it's like to be lonely. You can't ever say that. Christ is our great high priest. He's able to sympathize us in our weakness. He can say, well, I, I, I understand what that was like. And he's ready to minister to us. But he tells the disciples, you're going to leave me alone. But I'm really not alone. And that's the reality we've got to get now because we're part of this new reality as well. Because uh, I still have the Father. Though every person would abandon Christ, he could say, I still have the Father. But if we keep going... It takes us to a place to where even the Father abandons Christ. Because Christ literally, and this is, how do we understand this reality? Right? Christ is sinless. He's only known the Father from all eternity past. He takes our sin. He, he takes our sin upon himself. And the Father, the relationship switches from, from love to wrath. And I think at that moment... Jesus was the most alone person that's ever lived. But he doesn't abandon his soul to Sheol, does he? Because we have the promises of God that on the third day he would rise again. Christ was raised from the dead, and it was a Trinitarian work. It was the work of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And so we get to see that side. But I want, you to, to, I want, I want it to kind of hit you. Right? That Jesus was alone. And so when he tells you things like, you're going to have sorrow and you're going to lament, or in this world you're going to have tribulation, he's not speaking of like concepts that he doesn't ha know anything about. He's a realist. He's the realest man that's ever lived. Well, he tells them, I'm not alone. The Father's with me. And then he tells them this amazing statement. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Now he's not talking about this tribulation they're having now because you know at the resurrection they're going to have mega joy. But he's going to send them into the world and guess what? The world doesn't change. And all these disciples will know until the time that they die is tribulation. And I think this is true of every disciple. This is, this is our reality. You live in the world, and in the world you will have tribulation. But what is tribulation? What does it mean? Well, the most literal, which you, know, you can't always get the meaning of stuff if you hate the most literal, but I kind of like this. It means to be pressed. 
So you ever see somebody make coffee where they put it in a press and they squish it? That's kind of what it made me think of. You put that coffee in the press and then you apply the force and it just presses it down. And that's the world. Jesus says in the world you're going to have tribulation. You're going to be pressed. We, we, we might would say distressed or you could say tribulation. And this comes in many forms. Uh, it's not just one form. I mean, you may experience one of them at a time. You may experience all of them at once. The word is a wide range of kind of meanings that it can take on. It can mean physical. You might have physical distress from the world. Mental. The world may press you mentally. Social. Right? You can see that in the book of Acts, right? And economic. Physical, mental, social, and economic. The wor- in the world, you have tribulation. This is the reality of being a disciple of Jesus. There's two, there's two kind of spheres that we continue to live in. And they're really both here in this one passage. right? A disciple has two spheres or two realities. There's the reality of you being in the world. All right? We don't become Christians and leave. Nor does Jesus promise us health, wealth, success, non-stop happiness and freedom from tribulation. In fact, the opposite. He says, I'm sending you out into a world and it's going to be like you're going out like sheep among wolves. And in the world, right, he sends you into the world. This is a reality. Non-stop, constant tribulation. But there's the other reality. There's the reality of being in Christ. And that's what he says. I've said these things to you that in me you might have peace. See, for the Christian, our joy is never really in ourselves. It's always external, so the world can never take it. And then also the peace that we find is never really this inward sense of peace. It's an outward peace that gets put into us. And so the same thing applies. Peace is in Christ and therefore can never really be robbed It takes us back to the image of the vine. And again, the greatest teacher that ever lived on the planet was Jesus. He takes us back to the image of the vine again. In me. Remember that image of the vine? I'm the vine, and you're the branches. And in me, and you'll produce fruit. And it's all about being in him. It's really all about him and what God will do with us through him. And we're back there again. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. But if you're in me, you'll have peace. You see how this is working? John 15, 5. I am the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I'll say the last part again. Apart from me, you could do nothing. Now tell me, Christian. Is there a possibility for you to find peace anywhere in the world apart from Christ? And the answer is no. And yet we do. How foolish we are. In me, you will have peace. And he tells us here, apart from me, you can do nothing. There's no possibility for the Christian to find peace anywhere in this world. In anything, in any person, in any success, in any financial reapings, any fame, you're never going to find it. You can't. It's only found in Christ. It pertains to peace. But Jesus' disciples, they have peace because of Christ, because of what he's done for them. Yes, they they would cave here, right? They would cave in this first tribulation. But after his resurrection, this new reality takes place where they're engrafted through the Spirit, and now they're in Christ. And you can see that this has all changed. In the world, you have tribulation, and you just look at it. Look how these men remain faithful. No circumstances changed anything about this reality. And they faced the worst. They faced the worst circumstances. Jesus says in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let let them be afraid. The peace that Jesus gives is found in Him regardless of circumstances. You see how that is what he's trying to get to them? In the world, there's trouble. Uh, Let's not kid ourselves. Let's not kid ourselves, Jesus says to them. You're going to be pressed. You're going to be oppressed on every side. 
The world's coming after you. But in me, you'll have peace. It's peace despite all circumstances. And the world, the world knows nothing about this kind of peace. The world's peace is totally dependent on circumstances. Hence the massive rise in suicides this past year. Right? Suicides have skyrocketed. Why? Because people, they, they're tired of the isolation. They can't, they can't handle it. And they want the world to go back to normal. And the world's not going back to normal. Well, it's not going back to what it was. And so we've said several times, church, what if the world never went back to normal? It may not. Remember the New Year's sermon. Kind of the, new, the sermon to prepare for the new year. Well, the question and what I posed to you was this idea. Everybody thinks things are going away next year, and they're not. Same, stressor, same stresses, political unrest, racial turmoil, illness, death. It's all here. It's not going away. And so the world can't take it. The world goes from temporary peace to temporary peace. It's a peace that is dependent on circumstances. But the peace that Jesus gives is peace in spite of all these things. There's a little painting you could Google. It's, I'd recommend that you do. It's called Peace. If you Google it, Google Images, check it out. This painting Peace, it's really violent looking, kind of ironic, no? And there's a thunderstorm, like in the upper left, lightning bolts, and, they, and they, they're thrashing a, a wavy sea, and there's these sea rocks, and the ocean is slamming against them. And you're like, this is called peace. But then you look in the very middle of this painting. There's this little cleft in this cliff, and there's a dove laying, laying there on a nest. And then you're like, oh, that's why it's called peace. And that's the picture of Christianity. That's what Jesus is promising the disciples and what he promises us. It's not promising you some escapism. Like this stuff's gonna, this is gonna be your reality. But in the middle of all of that, he promises in me, you'll have peace. It's amazing. Jesus gives this incredible peace. It's a peace, it's his peace is supernatural. The world doesn't know about it. So Paul says in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And Jesus doesn't give like the world. He doesn't give peace temporarily to take it away. So we have to ask ourselves this question, right? As you look at your life, you look at your life and you think, you know, what have I been striving after to get this joy? Am I just going through life looking for happiness and it's circumstantial and I never have it really? But Jesus promises real joy. It's found in him. And then he promises a peace that the world can't take away. But yet, if you're honest with yourself, do you not run through this world looking for peace and all of these other things? When he's told you, apart from me, you can do nothing. How foolish it is for us to do this. But yet, isn't that the reality? As you sit there and you honestly examine yourself, don't we honestly run after these things that we think can give us a sense of peace? And yet, Christ is ready to minister to us even today, despite our failures. And it's one of the most encouraging things to me, I think, as I look at this passage about Christ. We often run for happiness and all these things, and we don't find it. When he's got joy for us, we're, we're so foolish, and we, we still do it. And we often look for peace in these other things. We're not, we're not very good disciples. It's kind of like we're flawed like these disciples, right? And when you look at the passage, the thing that has to stand out to you is these men abandoned Christ. They turned their back on him and abandoned him when he needed, he needed them the most. And thank goodness... Christianity is not about us or our ability to be good disciples. And I was reminded of that again. These promises of Christ are true because of his commitment to his disciples. Not because of his disciples' commitment to Christ. We all fail. We all, we're all imperfect. And we all engage in periods of foolishness where we run after things of this world. And I'm just so thankful 
Thank God. And I would tell you that if you have that stress on you and you say, man, I've done all I've, I've not had looked for happiness like that or peace like that. It's all dependent on Christ. His commitment to his disciples secures this reality. So I'd encourage you to acknowledge it, to turn from it, to repent and to trust Christ. This is Jesus' closing words to his disciples. Everything changes now. We go to John 17, an incredible prayer, and then the narrative kicks up with Jesus' arrest. These are the last words he got to say to them. They're vastly important, and they're incredibly relevant for you today. Jesus gives his people joy in a hostile world. He does it by giving them an unstealable source of joy, and he does it by providing a new way of prayer that the world knows nothing of, And Jesus secures peace and tribulation through his victory. He has overcome the world, right? The world is in chaos, but in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, the victory was already won. It's over. He's victorious. And in his victory, we're able to have peace. So I would urge you Christians to trust in Christ, uh, to be ministered to him by the Spirit today to find your joy and your peace in Him. And if you're here today and you aren't a Christian, and you say, you know, I, you, you, you've, got, you've got me. I've run through life looking for happiness and joy. And I find it sometimes. I find joy and peace sometimes, but then it's gone. And that's because you're, you're created for this. You're created for mega joy. And it's only available in Christ. Think about the love of God that he has for you to secure this incredible joy on your behalf that the Father would send the Son, his beloved, and he loves, he's loved him from eternity. He would send him to die for your sins. Just consider that if you're not a Christian, that God loves you in that way, that he would die for your sins. Not that he would die for sins. I don't want you to think about it that way. People think, oh, Jesus died for sinners. Think about it. Did Jesus die for me? I'm a sinner. Did he die for me? And if you know you're a sinner, the answer is yes. Christ died for you. He didn't die for you. He rose from the dead on the third day. He was victorious for you. He overcame the world so that he could pull you into this relationship, right? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. This is the source of all joy, and it's here for you today. If you would turn from your sins today, and I'm not telling you to do any work. You can't work your way to this God. I'm telling you just to run to him. To run to him like a father ready to receive you and trust in the work of Christ. And you'll find it. Forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and joy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. That even in these vast narrative sections, God, there's incredible truth. Help us to... God, to, uh, to see that you have a joy for us that is beyond what this world has to offer, that there's a peace for us, that no matter what happens this world and this world this coming year, that there's a peace that we can have, and you want to give it to us and help us to believe that. Thank you for the ministry of your son that he has done this for us, because we are imperfect disciples. We, we're often not faithful. And God, thank you that our relationship is not secured by our own works, but by a faithful Savior. God, I pray if there's any here that don't know Christ, I pray today would be that day. But we know this depends on your work, that only you can save. And so we ask, God, that you would save today for your own glory, for the fame of your name. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.